Welcome. This is Heather Knutson, Home Series Director of Marketing. I want to welcome each of you to today's Building Green and Creating Home Buyer Value webinar that is sponsored by Isonine. We know today's topic is of interest as we welcome our over 250 participants registered for today's event. Our first presenter today is Laura Lapierre from Isonine. As a responsible steward of the environment, Isonine is leading the insulation industry to a new level of sustainability through their commitment to environmentally sensitive spray foam insulation technology. And with that, we'll now hear a short presentation from the sponsor of today's webinar. Laura, I'm going to pass things over to you and Isonine. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here to represent Isonine on this webinar. I'll be discussing with you three quick topics, an overview of Isonine, one specific product application that I believe you will find of interest, and then a few slides on a new green energy addendum. First, about Isonine. Isonine's manufacturing operations are located in Mississauga, Ontario, with distribution centers in Memphis, Tennessee, Newark, New Jersey, and City of Industry in California. We have a full line of spray foam products, including both medium and low density, and dealers in over 30 countries globally. We maintain our strategic alignment with all of the organizations that you see represented here. First of all, what is spray foam? It is foamed in place liquid that expand into a foam plastic material that insulates and air seals. It controls air leakage and forms an integral part of an air barrier system in your homes and buildings. This slide illustrates the current product portfolio of Isonine in both open and closed cell products. Today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about an application using Classic Max, which is one of our premier open cell products. But I would also like to highlight in the closed cell category a world-breaking innovation we introduced last year as with the first water-blown closed cell, ProSeal Eco, which is also of interest in closed cell applications where architects and builders are interested in providing a more green option. First of all, let's talk about the attic application using Classic Max. Attic fires cause substantial loss of life and property every year in the United States, almost half a billion dollars in property loss with significant injuries and deaths. Since the introduction of the Unventic attic foam, we have seen that incidents where attic fires have begun have, where the attics are, have been insulated with spray foam, that these have reduced. If you notice the light blue lines showing the percentage of attic fires where there is um, spray foam insulation have decreased, where the incidence of fires overall have continued to increase. This information comes from the uh, National Fire Institute. What Isonine learned was that the commonly used fire test to determine whether a product is appropriate for use in unvented attics was something called an Appendix X test and was not demonstrating anything like a real-life unvented attic fire. The simple pass or fail ratio was the, the flame must not spread to the ceiling before 4 minutes and 18 seconds. And of course, our first question was, what happens at five minutes? We established some real-life testing between ourselves, the Product Evaluation Service, the ICCES, and an accredited fire consultant. During this process, we built various attic replicas. We used Isonine Classic Max within the structure. We put an attic hatch in, and in some instances, we we established that the floor was not completely air sealed, and in some tests it was sealed in others. In either case, the result was that the fire self-extinguished in less than a minute. In summary, Isonine Classic Max 
in an unvented attic configuration is the lowest risk configuration for constructing insulated attics. It still allows budget conscious builders to save money because with Classic Max you have the elimination of the additional ignition barrier material and along with that the elimination of additional labor expenses in applying this ignition barrier material. You can capture other cost offsets by using spray foam and you can really differentiate yourself within the marketplace as providing homes with this added element of safety. Because today's topic is about energy efficiency, I know that builders and home buyers are really concerned with the what's in it for me, apart from perhaps feeling good about the environment when they purchase a high performance home or an energy efficient home. And sometimes it's difficult to attract their attention with these improvements. One way that this can be done is through the re residential green and energy efficient addendum that the Appraisal Institute has created. The benefits of this addendum is that it provides one central place in an appraisal report to show the benefits of the green and energy efficient features. It standardizes the reporting process and it provides a basis for comparable sales selections. It also prepares the real estate industry, the builders, for potential legislation. And by that, of course, I mean the SAVE Act when it finally uh, passes into law. And it identifies the special characteristics and type that the appraiser needs. It really is a flag to the lender to show that the operating cost of the home can be lowered. This is the current appraisal form, the 1004, that many of you would be familiar with. And you can see by the blue arrow that there's only one small space on that form to indicate any high energy or high performance items that you may have added. With this new addendum, you can simply place in there the words referring uh, the lender to the residential green and energy efficient addendum. This is what it looks like, and you'll see the definitions of green building and the six elements of green building. If you notice the blue arrow here, it allows you to put in all of the different items in this comment section that you have provided in this home. It allows you at the top to indicate the certifications, the rating scores if you've had the building uh, determined to be LEED certified. And later on, you can attach the rating and the worksheet. Near and dear to my heart, of course, is the section on energy efficiency that refers to insulation. So you can indicate that the house has been spray foamed and as important, the envelope tightness of the home. When you indicate the envelope rating, you can provide the actual rating in the comment section along with the local building code requirement so that you can, again, demonstrate very clearly that your, built, that your home is built with an envelope rating that is higher than current code requires. You can put in the HERS rating as well as the Home Energy Score rating and attach the report. One critical element is, in particular if it's new construction, is to show the average monthly utility cost for a code home compared to this particular property. So for the exam uh, or as an example, and this is just a strictly made up number, if the home that you built had a HERS rating of 46, and the 2009 code requirement is 85, then you can indicate that your property is 39% more energy efficient than code. And the code built energy cost would be, again, this is where I've estimated the numbers, $2,100 compared to $1,300 for this high performance house. 
why this is important to you as a builder and to a potential homeowner is that they can use this when they're negotiating for their mortgage. It can either permit them to buy a, and have a larger mortgage or more favorable terms as they can demonstrate the operating cost of their home being reduced. If you want more information on the um, green energy addendum, it is contained within Chapter 6 of the Appraisal Institute. I have the link here as well as um, Sandy Adamatis' information, who has been someone who has been instrumental in developing uh, this green energy addendum. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Molly. Thank you, Laura. That was terrific. And we actually had a couple questions come in from some builders already, so I'm making some notes, and we'll save those for the end if we have some time. Um, so that's terrific. Thanks so much for that great information. And as we gear up for the second half of 2014, that's great food for thought. Um, just a reminder, we had a couple questions come in. If anyone else has questions, please type them in your chat box. Um, Molly will be available for questions at the end if we have some time as well. And we're now going to turn our attention over to the core presentation from John Burns Real Estate Consulting. They're an industry leader in housing research. I'll be providing an overview on building green, creating home buyer value. And with that, I'd like to now pass things over to uh, our presentation with Molly Carmichael. Molly is the principal at John Burns in the custom consulting practice. Molly. Oh, Molly, I just want to make sure we're having a little bit of a sound issue there. Um, if you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? There you go. That's just perfect. Thanks. Sure. One small right. technical dif okay. difficulty and you sound just great. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Okay. I'm going to... So let's do this. Hold on. Okay. While she's getting set up there, just a, a reminder, we've got PCBC coming up, and I know Molly is going to be speaking out in San Francisco as well. So my contact information will be shared at the close of this event. Um, and if you'd like to, to meet with Molly at John Burns, um, I know that Isonine is going to have a representative there as well, and, and we are as well at Homesphere. So looks like you're, you're live, and things look good, Molly. Okay, good. Thanks, Heather. Um, well, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I know everyone's time is valuable. I'm going to talk about what consumers want as it relates to green and what I'm calling the green that counts. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion about green technology and energy efficiency, and I thought I would take some time on the recent study we did for Consumer Insights 2014 and share some of the comments on that. So let's dive right in. I'm going to um, just go to the, just as a quick introduction uh, to our company. Um, we are a real estate company that works all over. We do monthly research. Um, basically, we track everything that you can think of as it relates to making a better real estate decision. Uh, lots of trends and forecasting specific to your local markets as well as from a macroeconomic standpoint for the nation. In addition, we do custom consulting on the ground in markets all over the country. And of course, we do a lot of consumer research as well, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Our market coverage is national, and we do actually have offices all over the country, um, as well as you can see by the yellow points areas that we've done uh, quite a bit of custom consulting as well. Um, this is a summary of the key leadership that we actually have um, throughout the country. So from Chicago to the East Coast, down in Florida, Texas, uh, quite a few people in Southern California and giving given all of the um, new product laboratory stuff that's really popping out here, we also tend to do a lot of work all over the country as well. Um, this is a, a, a sample, or really, um, I call it sort of the, the, the circle of success um, that we believe in, and it's really why we do a lot of the consumer research we're doing, and it's what we're going to talk about today. But of course, our core business is tracking market trends on a monthly basis, and John does a lot of that with our research team. But we also do a proprietary demand model on what consumers um, are buying today, who they are from a life stage standpoint, and what they want. And then we look at the more traditional things like the rest of those folks out there, like housing supply, um, who's doing what, how they're doing it, uh, testing all kinds of different products with architects and so forth. And then, of course, financially testing. Um, 
because we know there's more than one solution. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about in consumer research today, it's not just about do consumers want it, but will they pay for it? And what are those key components um, that they're going to pay for? So with that, consumer insights for those of you who are new uh, to some of the research we've done, it went out to over a million consumers, and they're all new home shoppers. Our focus is proactive and forward thinking, so we're asking consumers what they want in their next home. And in almost every case, we ask them, not only do you want it, but will you pay X? And with the help of a lot of purchasing folks and new home builders out there, not only did the new home builders push it out to their email list um, of shoppers that have been to their offices, but they also participated in the, the building of this survey and so forth. We had a ridiculous amount of questions, 100 plus, um, and we can break this information up by geography, by life stage, by ethnicity, you name it. Um, but we're going to talk from a very big picture uh, nationally today. So with that in mind, um, a little bit about the survey itself. It was an email survey, um, and it was very visual. So we allowed people to not only see what we were asking them about, but we also allowed them to look at all these different variables together uh, to make their decisions. The survey focus was everything from attitudinal stuff, like how they live, how they shop, what they value. We talked about interiors, interior styles and preferences, exterior style preferences. We even asked them their favorite pair of shoes for the weekend, texture, color. Um, and our, our last uh, presentation was about home and bath. Um, our kitchen and bath, and we have a lot on layout and then, of course, community amenities. Today, we're going to focus on a portion of that survey, and that's green and energy efficiency. So let's first look at the shopper profile. So who did we talk to? Who is uh, represented in this sample? And that's really important um, to look at. And in many cases, we will break out the answers by generation. Um, and we can break this out even further by price point and so forth. Uh, but given the time, we're going to talk nationally. And then we're going to talk, in some cases, by age groups. This is actually the location of every single consumer who took the survey. So we're very well diversified throughout the country. We hit all the major new home. Uh, large MSAs across the country, but areas like South Dakota or Wyoming certainly did not have a big presence because there's not a lot of, of new home there. Um, from a generational standpoint, everybody likes, likes to talk about the generations. Um, we had a very healthy sample size from the baby boomers. That was That is the number one shopper out there. With over 20,000 consumers who took the survey, we're very confident in saying that is uh, more than statistically accurate to call the new home shoppers number one generation out there is the baby boomer. They tend to take about three to four times as long as the conventional buyer to buy a home, so it's not unusual we would see more baby boomers out there despite the fact we are seeing more transaction activity out there from Gen X. But with that, also says that the baby boomer probably isn't finding what they're looking for. Um, and we definitely do see that in our information. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Gen Y today is the smallest shopper out there, but it's important to look at how we track Gen Y. Um, so be looking at that as well. Um, but for Gen Y, um, a big portion of that has to do with the fact that the youngest Gen Y is 14 years of age. Um, and they do go up to about 33 years of age. So we do see the biggest propensity for Gen Y to actually purchase new homes to really begin in their young 30s. Um, the number of consumers between the age of 20 and 30 that's actually getting married has dropped by 38 to 40 percent um, currently when you compare that to 1970. So the percentage of uh, Gen Ys that are actually getting married, which obviously impacts things like home ownership, uh, certainly has brought a, a smaller presence of that group into the market. But we do, in our survey, have 15%. In 2012, that percentage of population was 17%, so it's still a very healthy percentage and pretty close to that actual number. But in 2017, it's 25%. And by 2019, the Gen Y population should be as big as their parents as far as that uh, 20 plus population. As we look to life stage now, um, because we have found looking at the generational information, looking at the life stage information, 
LifeStage has a much bigger influence on how people purchase, the kind of products they purchase, how far they drive down highways and things like that. And so we do look at this information more commonly by LifeStage. We are seeing a huge percentage of non-family out there, um, and about 30% of that total shopping population out there, new home shopping population, is families uh, with children under the age of 18. There is another 5% that we've separated out that we call Family Plus, and that is all of those boomer families that the youngest child is 18 years or older that are either back or staying uh, until they find their next home to live. We also look at this by ethnicity, and it's really interesting to look at ethnicity trends by these different generations as well, because we're finding the younger the profile, the more ethnically diverse the profile is that's actually shopping out there today. But overall, it's largely a Caucasian market out there looking at new homes. We do see about 9% of the Asian population, which is pretty close to the overall percentage for the nation, so that's pretty close. And then you'll see a, a dispersed number of or percentages for the rest of the ethnic groups. Looking at buyer motivation, this is one that I cover in almost every presentation, so for those of you who have heard this, bear with me. Um, but this is a really important diagram to actually follow. We measure buyer motivation based on affluence. So for the very least affluent, most affordable consumer group, it starts with price and affordability being the primary motivator. And this is important as we talk about green technology and energy efficiency because energy efficiency features add to affordability. It becomes a much more important feature when it impacts affordability. And you're going to see that actually in our numbers. So again, if you can't pay, you can't play. And so that's really rule number one to get into that game. You have to have the necessary down payment and the ability to pay those monthly payments. The second one is really location. And location, 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 it tends to be sort of that top um, a motivator to actually go out and purchase a home, but if I can't afford to live in the best location, I'm going to keep driving down highways until I can get to that location I can afford. So that's why price really does trump location for that less affluent, a more affordable price point. Then from there, I'm going to find the right interior home design layout that really accommodates my life stage, and that's where life stage becomes very important. LifeStage influences actually location as well as interior home design, but LifeStage influences interior home layout as well because if I have children, I need more bedrooms. If I don't have children, how big is my family room um, and dining room need to be? All those kinds of things that certainly get influenced by interior home design layout. Then the next portion are things like I need built for the family. I, I would love to have good schools. I would love to have a great exterior. I'd love to have the best community amenities. And the last but not least, I would love to give back to my community, have environmentally sensitive practices, and all those things that go with green technology. But those are privilege features. So everything from good schools to exterior style to community amenities to green technology for the environment, those are things that I want to have but they are privileged features that I have to afford. I want to have good schools, but if it comes down to having a bedroom for my child, the bedroom for the child actually wins. Or how far do I have to drive and what is my driving tolerance as I go down certain highways? I have to have a grocery store. So that's why we have the first four that are essential features, and then we really have the second four that are privileged features. And so that's really how that is influenced. And that's going to play a part as we talk about energy efficiency and green technology. So when we look at what the response was this last year, we've been tracking this now for four years. Um, and remember, the buyer that's actually out there or the shopper that's out there looking for a new home has more affluence than the lowest income person out there. So for that new home shopper, location does rank as number one. It's ranked as number one for the last four years. Last year and the years before, home design has been a very close second. Last year was 0.4% away from being the top feature that motivates consumers to actually go out and buy a new home. It's dropped down to number three, and that's largely because prices have gone up quite a bit and quite a few MSAs all the way across the country. So price is now putting more pressure 
on things like home design. And with that, affordability is becoming more crucial. So those energy efficiency features that have been sort of a, hey, maybe I'll get to that later, that can be a pretty crucial thing to be talking to your customers about because affordability is a much bigger deal to bigger deal today than it has been. And then comes in safety, neighborhood street appeal. Now schools fall down fairly low um, and that has to do with the fact that we have more boomers out there or more non-family buyers out there than family buyers. When you look at just the family segment, you're going to find that schools will actually jump above neighborhood street appeal. But street appeal becomes more important for that boomer shopper and things like that. And then you can see how those, those come to play as we go down. Now, energy savings technology ranks at the, uh, close to the bottom. Environmentally sensitive practices ranks at the bottom when we're looking at all of these features. The only thing that I would underscore is that energy savings technology, if you can correlate that with price and those monthly savings, it becomes a totally different proposition. So you have to make it less about um, we're doing this to be energy efficient as opposed to going that direction, what I would be selling to your customer is, look, we have looked at how to maximize your housing costs and actually what you're going to pay for this home. And with that, uh, much like a green car would and some of these other things, we've looked at what your utility bills are and we really think we can influence it by X. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we actually go. So location, location, location. Location continues to be number one. We talked about price moving up from number four to number two. And, and home design remains one of the top three motivators. I like to underscore with home design, it's the number one way that you can easily influence your buyers uh, to buy your home versus another home. It's much harder to influence location or price because uh, that's really driven by the land itself. So now let's drive into um, uh, how this is impacted by generation because it's certainly important. And if you look at it, energy savings and environmentally sensitive practices actually ranks as the lowest. However, if you look at it for the silent generation and the baby boomers, it's actually a much bigger number when it comes to energy savings. One, they can afford to actually pay that upfront cost. But two, they're much more concerned about being financially stable and consistent for the next several years. So they're much more likely to be looking at those energy savings uh, areas like that technology, some of the technology things that you can offer. Um, as we look to um, those same things by region, you'll actually see once again um, the, the two actually land at the bottom nationally, but we start to see those becoming much more important to the Southwest certainly to Texas, and of course, much higher temperatures in Phoenix and Las Vegas. Texas, certainly August is not the best month to visit, that's for sure. Um, Northern Florida, that tends to be a little bit more about the environment, and it also tends to be about, we have an older profile there, um, so uh, Northern Florida, and then also Northern California. So you can see that some of these influences, they do become bigger and more important uh, features as we look at some of this by region. And we can actually break this out for you by price point and some of that stuff to do a, lot, a much deeper dive. So as we look at home efficiency specifically, let's look at uh, really what they, they want and what they talked about. So 91% of our consumers, actually they want energy efficient products if they actually save on their monthly expenses. So prove it to them. Show them. Um, I know her scores has, has been a great way to actually prove that. I will tell you consumers, and you'll see the numbers on this, they don't fully understand them. I don't know that they even trust the monthly bill that comes from the builder. But the more and more you can actually show what those features do and why they actually will save you money, I think that's really a better way to go. Um, and I've seen some great builders out there do a, a very good job on this, and I've seen other builders spend money on this and simply miss the whole marketing on this. So don't spend the money if you're not going to market it. I mean, it's just such a fantastic opportunity. So 91%, that's a big number, want energy efficient products. Um, the example I always use is if you're going to buy a new cell phone, you want to know what the new features are. So if you're going to pay a premium for that new cell phone, it, it better be evident day one 
or when you're looking at it. It's the same thing for a home, and that's really what energy efficient products do for you. It's what is the latest and greatest technology, and show me what that is and what it does for me. 65% actually said they'd pay for it. So another 65%, so the number does drop down to 65%, so they'd pay another $7,500 for more green or energy efficient products in order to get monthly savings. And I'm going to show you specifically what they believe that means. So what is it that makes up green or energy efficient products in their mind, and what do they see as uh, those features that will give them monthly savings? 73% actually said they would buy design features first over energy efficient features. So it's important to note they still want their granite countertops. They still want their you know, Java cabinets. That's the number one color that consumers want today. So it's really important to be thinking about the big wow items in the home that are important. Um, I've seen a lot of builders like Garbet's a good one. They'll, they'll actually, Garbet Homes will do a great job of giving them some great sexy, good-looking features in the home, but they still give them great green features or energy efficient features too. So just know what the consumer will pay for and what they want. Hit those big ticket design features first and then show them how you've thought about their monthly expenses as well through these energy efficient features and being a sophisticated builder. 55% actually want green products that are good for the environment. So as you can see, we sort of ratcheted down. We went from 90 plus percent that want it. We then went to the 60 plus percent that said they'd pay for it if it gave them monthly savings. And we dropped down to 55% that really are going to do it because it's good for the environment. And that percentage is highest amongst the older profile. Now 55% is not a small percentage. That still says there is more than half the consumers walking through your sales offices that actually want green products because it's good for the environment. So sell that. You know, I think it's also a good message that you care about more than uh, just the bottom line, that you do care about this sort of uh, more altruistic approach uh, to what's going on in the world today. And I think consumers generally and genuinely respect that. 82% um, will actually pay another $5,000 for upgraded energy efficient materials. So um, the things like um, uh, you know, insulation and all those kinds of things, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But as important to that, consumers were more than twice as likely to pay for energy efficient materials over things like home entertainment, home automation, smart monitoring, and I see lots of that, but they were twice as likely to pay for energy efficient materials that makes their home, frankly, more efficient, and once again, going back to that top motivator, or one of those top motivators, which is monthly expenses and price. The top five energy efficient features, so we asked them, tell us what energy efficiency means to you. What were the top five things? And they're not as complicated as you think. Um, and some of them tie to some of the things our sponsor shared with us today. Number one, it's simply newer windows. So things like Lowy glass and, and dual pane and, and just the real simple things there. Programmable thermostat, just having, um, and dual zone comes up a lot on, in the, the bigger homes that we hear from our consumers. That's a great way to lose customer service score by not making sure, by making sure that you have dual zone and some of that stuff. But having a programmable thermostat Again, that maximizes your energy costs as well as uh, holds that temperature consistent when you need it. Adequate insulation. So again, our sponsor talked a lot about that. Insulation, you're going to see, comes up twice in our top five. Um, fourth is a new AC unit. So clean air, efficient, uh, efficient for monthly savings as well. I've had a bad AC unit that like sucked the energy cost and was really expensive. We never ran it, get a brand new one, and wow, did it change our cost. Uh, number five, high insulation standards. So look at that. Number three and number five both have to do with having not only adequate insulation, but high insulation standards. Consumers can get their mind around that. It's easy to understand. They can grasp it, and they understand how that can have a positive impact on um, their monthly costs. 
her scores, you know, this is what I'm seeing all over the country. A lot of builders are really trying to explain this, but it's hard to understand. And the best way I explain it to customers or I ask our marketing firms and so forth to explain it is it's almost like miles per gallon. So I, I almost think that somebody should come out with a marketing campaign of miles per gallon and convert her scores to that because consumers get that. But only 28% of our consumers actually said they would trust that to um, actually determine what energy efficiency means to them. Uh, so that's a pretty low score, but I do see that growing over time. But educate them. Educate, educate, educate. And educate, once again, how that drives to their bottom line price and monthly savings. The next one is, which I think is extremely valuable, I was a builder for 10 years, so I constantly was trying to achieve you know, great JD Power scores, great customer service scores, and I think to some degree we focused more on our reputation more than some of the other big and, and very important things, but 43% of our consumers actually said that having great energy efficiency and demonstrating that was an indicator of that builder's reputation. It reflected that they were a better builder. So that's really important if you're uh, looking to, again, continue to boost your reputation um, as well as build great homes. 41% said that energy efficient, an energy efficient home should actually have solar panels. So we're getting much uh, uh, closer to the lower scores. Now, one of the things that I did as a builder, if it was in that sort of 30 to 40% or less, that was an indicator for me that we should option that. Anything that was really in that 50% or greater, we knew that should be an included feature. Not to say that solar panels or some really great programs out there should not be included in certain instances. Again, the active adult consumer in the southwestern regions, Phoenix, Vegas, Texas, and these much warmer climate climates, I think that could be a huge competitive advantage as long as you can get the economics uh, to work and, uh, and meet the monthly payment that they can afford. Um, only 29% actually really want to hear from the builder <laughs> to actually prove um, with energy bills. Um, part of that, I believe, is a trust factor. Um, another part of that is um, they really want to see what it is. I mean, they want to understand what's under the hood, insulation, windows, and really some basic things, programmable programmable thermosets. What are the things that are going to help me to run an efficient home? Demonstrate it. Show me. And then I'll be convinced that we're going to have a, a more efficient home by buying a home with XYZ Builder. The last one, and this is pretty important, uh, it's one of the biggest answers of all, and that is only 7% said that energy efficiency was not important to them. So said a different way, 93% of the consumers that are shopping new homes all across the country feel like having an energy efficient home was important to them. And energy efficiency is about providing not only just a more efficient home, but frankly more efficient energy bills and driving dollars to their bottom line. So the more and more you can do that through windows, thermostats, insulation, some of those just simple basics, and then market that. I think you have a great opportunity out there to either increase, increase revenue and or increase absorption. 97% um, actually want the lowest operating cost they possibly can. So we asked them why is it important and the number one reason was, again, price, price, and price. And that's about getting the lowest operating cost. We also asked them, um, Again, the same question, why is energy efficiency important to them? And 90% said that they actually want to prepare for rising energy costs. So it's not about just maintaining my costs now. This really comes out of those warmer climates specifically, but it really comes from that 45 plus consumer or active adult consumer that really is concerned about being able to afford that next home that they're going to purchase long term and being able to maintain what those costs are going to be, and that includes simple things like heat, air conditioning, uh, things like that. 86% um, said um, that it actually proves that their builder is using the best practices. So going back to sort of that reputation thing that we talked about earlier, um, it's important to them because it proves they're, they're buying a home from a really good builder. 
Um, 76% um, when asking them why energy efficiency was important said um, they really do want to have less of an impact on the environment. Every time I do qualitative groups and quantitative groups, um, I'm, I mean sometimes, <laughs> depending on the groups I've had, I've had people literally tear up over why energy efficiency is great. I, I had one person just um, really break down in tears because someone used a styrofoam cup in their office. I mean, they're, they're very passionate about it, but at the same time when I ask them how many people here have green products and are paying more for them, that's really where, you know, hands are down. And so you really have to demonstrate um, that how it's environmentally sensitive, I think it's a great uh, part of your story, your company philosophy, and certainly something I would encourage uh, making this world a better world with. Um, however, again, focus on that in the sensitive to the environment as well as a sensitive to their pocketbook. That's it. Um, that's a summary of, of energy efficiency and what we think you guys should be thinking about. And as important, I think one of the most important parts, if I were to sum up, how you market to your consumers and understanding what they want to understand and how it will actually bring dollars to their bottom line and yours. So with that. I would open it up for questions. Thanks, Molly. That was terrific. And interesting to see insulation hit um, two times on your top five list. I thought that was a nice tie-in to Isonine. And also interesting to hear you were a builder in your past life. I, that's something I learned today. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was cool. So we had some questions that came in. Um, I want to make sure, Laura, if you can unmute yourself. I've got some questions for the Isonine team as well. Um, Laura, are you with us? Okay. There you go. Perfect. I'm, I'm going to mute it down. Okay. Your question came in first, so I'm going to start with you. Um, okay. First question that came in for, for Isonine was, would the use of your material possibly eliminate the need or use of fire sprinklers? In um, Everything is dependent on the building code that is in your area, so I, I never want to answer on behalf of a building code official. but. Um, I have not seen any requirement for sprinklers in residential unvented attics. Okay. And Molly, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself as well here, and we'll just stay. I've got questions for both of you, so perfect. Uh, the first question that came in for you in your presentation, um, and you, you expanded on this, so I think it came in, but I'll let you expand on it a bit more just in case. It said, are schools not a function of the desirability of a location? And I know you talked about that. Maybe just expand on it a little bit. You talked about the boomers are shopping more, but maybe touch on that again. Sure. You know, it's it's probably one of the most debated things that I talk about in the in the top motivating factors. It comes up consistently because at the end of the day, schools definitely not only influence the location, but they influence the value of the location. So even if you don't have children, consumers will say, what are the schools? Because that really supports the investment of the area. The most important part to focus on, though, is the order of priority. And so it starts with, can I afford to purchase a home? And then where can I live with the amount of money that I have? And then based on whether it's one person or 10 people, what does the interior home layout have to look like? And then uh, one of the huge things, uh, aside from social infrastructure, entertainment, and all of that stuff, is I want to be by people. I, w I need to have amenities. I need to be able to be by a grocery store. And then come schools. And so um, I'll give you a great example. I have done focus groups, um, you know, having geographic uh, rankings and things like that and asking consumers to rank what's most important. Um, and in areas that are more tertiary locations where they are just getting into a home, squeaking into a home because they just want to own a home for their kids, uh, they're very unaware of what the test scores are. But going into the most affluent locations, because remember that hierarchy changes based on affluence, um, it's all they talk about is schools. So yes, it's absolutely important, but it's a privilege and it really is, um, you know, it's based on affluence and how much you can actually afford in these given locations. Should every developer plan for great schools? Absolutely. Should every builder buy locations with great schools? Absolutely but it is a privilege based on affordability and it does shift based on affordability. 
Thanks for expanding on that. I've got one more question for you while you're, you're speaking here. Um, this came in from Heather McCune. Is there any sense that green crosses over into the home design realm, or is it strictly a product definition? It definitely moves into the home design world, and I'll give you a good example of that. And a big shout out and hello to Heather McCune, uh, super lady. Um, but uh, it does. And what I have found is you're going to find, as a simple example, um, people who love more contemporary products, uh, they tend to be, believe it or not, this is going to sound counter to what most people know, but they tend to be older, uh, and they tend to want more green features in their homes. Um, there are a lot of great green products that I think are just good looking, and in my opinion, green products don't have to cost more either. Um, the BMW uh, Mini came out with a, a green car that was less expensive than uh, their 5 Series, um, and it did very, very well. It was good looking, um, and yet had green features, and actually did better than you know, some of their more expensive cars. So I definitely think green can be not only a product feature, but I think it can be an entire design story and marketing program, uh, and frankly, a whole neighborhood could be designed around it. The only thing I would caveat that with is a lot of developers first, and then builders, because uh, builders have to watch the bottom line. Um, it tends to be more sensitive for them, is... Uh, you know, you can't add $7 a square foot in green features if you're not going to get paid for that extra $7 a square foot. So it's really important to know what they'll pay for and what they won't pay for and how that plays into the overall campaign and what you're selling and lifestyle livability. Great good question. <clears throat> yeah, great question indeed. And um, Angela Cooper also asked, and I think you touched on this in the beginning in your Consumer Insights survey, but just a reminder to everybody, because um, there's some great information there, how many people were in your study again, and then when was it conducted? It's a good question. So we actually launched the survey uh, from July through to September 30th of last year. We launched it to over a million people. And we had over 22,000 people who actually took the survey. Um, we had 13,000 total completes, but we do a random thing on the questions. And we had up to 22,000 people who took parts of that survey. But uh, to be statistically accurate for the country, it's usually about 4,500. So we were more than um, two times what we needed and almost three times what we needed to be statistically accurate. But uh, we had an amazing response this year. It was fantastic, thanks to the builders. Yeah, it's a great response rate. Laura from Isony, we got another question that came in for, me, for you and your team. Um, what is the noise at attenuation difference between your product and, and fiberglass batten, uh, especially between, I think we're talking about multifamily here, especially between units in common where there's a shared wall or ceiling or side by side? Um, I can't, unfortunately, give uh, direct um, information on that. If there's a specific project, I would encourage you because it, w it is more of a design factor. What we know, what I can say confidently, is that um, there is a sound attenuation improvement in um, in plumbing runs within uh, within homes. That's one of the uh, main uh, reasons uh, that, uh, apart from the energy efficiency, that this is installed in people's homes for sound attenuation, and um, uh, and I think it would have a really strong impact in a multifamily location. And again, I would uh, encourage you to go to um, our website and send in your specific project question to our building science team and they, they will have a look at your project and give you a more definitive answer. And do you want to just say that website one more time for people who hadn't heard of Isonine before today? Good heavens. It's <laughs> Well, so perfect. -E .com. Perfect. I just want to make sure we've got that for anybody who's okay. in trouble spelling. So, and, and my contact information is presented at the end, and I'm happy to uh, connect you guys to that website as well. So, Molly, we touched on your survey from last year and your great response rate, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'll let you, you answer this question. Um, can the data be sorted to isolate preferences by state and then by generation? 
They can. We, we actually had such a great response in all of the new home locations across the country. Um, you have to have about 92 responses per MSA to have an accurate sample. And, and we had that in most of all the new MSAs in addition to state, in addition to region, in addition to national. So we have a very healthy response to get specific. Um, depending on the location, it breaks down as to whether or not we can give you the right answers by life stage within an MSA. Um, but one of the most amazing things that I have learned through doing this for the last several years is there, there are a few things that are different by geographic regions, but some of the bigger things like energy efficiency, um, it really is influenced to some degree by different weather and, and climates like that. But the big picture stuff, it's amazing how similar the trends are. Um, exterior home design is another one that tends to be more geographic specific, but but there are things that we can do to help you both nationally, regionally, by state, and at the MSA with this information. Thanks for asking that question, though. Great. And I actually have three questions that came in, and it's interesting because they're all kind of a common theme here for you, Molly. And it's talking about um, Bart's asking, Bart Lidden, um, we've been told you can give us some pointers on selling the cost savings. So it sounds like builders are still struggling with it. You know, customers are saying they want it, but how do we sell it? Um, and then it ties in with John Kurowski's question of, would you say it's better to market the features and benefits of energy efficiency versus a variety of green features? So maybe you could tie in with that but the questions that are coming in are, are all along that common theme. Here, here's what I would market, and I think it's the most important part of this, is that you've designed a home specifically for them and based on their affordability. And with that, your home costs X. And in addition to that, we didn't stop with just home price. We also thought beyond home price because we understand how you live. And, and these are the things that we thought about. Your utility bills, if you're living in a resale home, you know, and, and this is where her scores can help, albeit they still don't understand it, but you have to follow the, the understanding or the definition of her score with, let me tell you the things that influence that. We have better insulation. So we have foam insulation, and compared to these kinds of insulations, here's what that does for this. In addition, you've got programmable thermostats. That's obviously going to um, help you control the air, consistency of climate. And that's not just energy efficiency. That's just feeling good. And, and think about how great that is. And then newer windows. Go touch a new window or, or touch a window in a resale home. And if it doesn't have low E or if it doesn't have dual pane. And I, I've seen the displays in the garage. And in my opinion, those are a little bit, I, they're great. I mean, I think it helps you to kind of quickly do a touch, build, go. Um, but I think you have to talk to the customer and say, these are the things that we thought about for you, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, or Mr. So-and-so, or Mrs. So-and-so. And, and these are the things that are really going to influence the difference in how you live. But it's, it's not just about your monthly payment that we thought about. We also thought about all these other points that really add uh, to a better quality of life and better savings at the end of the day. But I think we make it too technical. I mean, I really do. I think you know, having all the bugs everywhere and some of those other things, it's really simple things that they're asking for when we got into the details. And a big part of it was insulation and windows. I mean, those were some of the simple big factors that they're looking for. Um, I think when we get into Energy Star and get too technical, they're like, oh my god, just make it stop. Um, they get windows. They get insulation. They get thermostats. They, you know, uh, they get some of those uh, very simple basics that do add to the bottom line. Great. And I know, and I know a lot of the system by code, too, so mm -hmm. I would probably steer from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had one last question come in. I want to be considered everybody's time today. We had a great presentation, so we'll end with one last question for you, Molly, from Bruce Gilman, um, along those same lines of, have you done a study of green product to divide emotional versus financial consumer benefit? Has, has the John Burns Group done a study pertaining to that? We have, uh, we have, and and really, I consider the you know ten to fifteen questions we have in this that does divide the emotional versus the financial. So we do ask them, you know, are you doing this for the good of the planet? Are you doing this for monthly savings? And then we have 
broken that up by life stage, by region, by MSA. And interestingly enough, when I put this presentation together, um, there's a lot more detail that sits behind this. But where it became a big influence is where I presented the facts, like, for example, um, energy costs do influence, um, um, energy efficient features do shift based on the weather climate, so I included that. But the differences by generation aren't huge, um, except for the fact that that more affluent buyer and tend to be older buyer can afford it. So, so there's a lot more detail. Um, if you want to call, I'm happy to go through more of that in detail with you. But these were really the big picture highlights, and any of the detail that sits behind that, I did bring in. Um, I did bring in those influences, but I didn't hit everything. If it didn't, you know, if it didn't change the message, if that makes sense. But hopefully you saw some of that in the research you saw today. That sounds like a good note to end on. And we've gotten some, some really positive feedback here. Again, we'll send out a, a post-event email with my contact information. Molly has been kind enough to share her contact information as well and, and opened herself up for additional questions. So I want to thank both Molly Carmichael at John Burns Real Estate Consulting as, re as well as Laura LaPierre at Isonine for your valuable information today. Um, thanks to everyone. Remember to take a moment to like Homesphere and Space on Facebook to stay tuned for future webinars and event opportunities. Uh, we have another webinar coming up on July 22nd, so mark your calendar and save the date. And if you're a builder and you want to connect with us to learn more about collecting rebates with per preferred partners such as Isonine, please reach out to me directly. I'm happy to help with that. And with that, my thanks to each of you and a good day. Thanks, Heather.